Okay, um, good morning guys. Uh, my name is Mo Philippinoman Ahmed and I will be your first speaker for today. The topic that I will be covering today will be about investing. Before we start, I would like to remind you guys that I am not a financial advisor whatsoever. So please do not take my advice blindly and always do your own research before investing. Next slide. So to start, I would like to brief you guys about investing itself, such as what is investing, where you guys can invest, and how to invest your money, and even why you need to invest. Next slide. Okay, so the basics first, which is what is investing. From what I understand from this course, uh, investing is basically an act where someone would put their money into a financial scheme, property, stocks, with the expectation for that money to grow over the years. Some of you may hear about the terms invest in yourself. Well, if you imply the same meaning as now, investing in yourself would be an act where you put your time and effort into something with the expectation that your skills and knowledge would grow over the years. For example, if you're a student, you would, spend, you would spend years studying about a certain topic or in a certain field so that as you grow older, you would have knowledge, you would have a lot of knowledge regarding that topic. After you finish your degree, you would spend some more years doing your master's, your PhD, so that you would be really, really good in that field. For example, I myself is taking a degree in mechanical engineering and after I graduated, I might continue my studies by doing my master's and then my PhD. So that as I grow older, I would become a really, really good engineer. My knowledge on engineering generally would expand as I grow older because of all the time and effort that I spend studying. Same situation can be applied to someone who is a, a sports person. They would spend years training, perfecting their skills and moves so that they can be one of the best, if not the best player out there. This is what invest this is what invest in yourself essentially means. But we're not gonna talk about that today. The topic that I'll be talking about for the next 25 minutes is about investing your money. So right off the bat, why do you need to invest? As a student, why is it so important for you to invest your money right now? Well, to answer that we need to see first how investing really works. Um, there's three types of people that I know. The ones that would invest their money, the ones that would save their money, and the ones that wouldn't do neither. So now the last one is very dangerous because if you don't start saving or investing as of right now, then you wouldn't have enough money for yourself in the future. Especially us college students that are going to graduate soon and enter adult life. Mm. As a fresh graduate, you are really you are really going to need every single cent in order for you to survive in your future. For example, if you buy a car, then you're gonna need the money to pay off your loans. Or if you rent a place somewhere, then you're gonna have to pay the rent. Or or, or maybe you like to pay off your loans, your PTPN loans, your scholarships. Here we can clearly see that once we graduated, money plays an important role in order for us to survive post graduate. Some people, they don't want to invest, they don't want to save their money and they would simply say that um, you, we're going to receive our paycheck once we get a job anyway and, and the money that we receive can be used to pay all those sorts of stuff like the loans and the, the rent. So, so why do we need to invest our money as a student right now? Well, although that's not entirely wrong, as a fresh graduate, you don't get the job straight after you graduate. Right? There will be a phase where you're going to, through multiple jobs and to find a job and we know better now, don't we, as to how difficult it is to get a job these days. So during that phase, that time where you're still un unemployed and you don't have any money, so money is a key factor for you to survive and go through that phase until you finally get a job in a stable income. <clears throat> so that is the first reason as to why we as a student uh, should, be, should be investing starting today so that we are able to have money to use for us in, uh, before we get a job. It's almost like saving, like you put aside 50 ringgit from your monthly allowance every month and you put the money in your bank. Which comes to our second reason as to why you need to invest and not save your money in the bank. The obvious reason for that would be because of inflation. So what is inflation? The simplest way to understand about inflation is that it simply means the value of your money drops because the market value or the price of the IP increases over the years. No one is safe when it comes to inflation, and I believe that everyone here has had an experience with an inflation with inflation themselves. Taking it from my experience, um, back in the days when I was in the in the primary school, 
uh, I could live off 10 ringgit for a week, meaning that I, I spend only 2 ringgit a day during this size, which is true because nasi lemak back in the day cost about 1 ringgit and, and a cup of water would cost about uh, 50 cents. Some of you would say that um, back then I don't eat much. I don't. I was a kid back then, so of course two ringgit a day would be more than enough. But that is not the case because when it comes to inflation, um, nowadays a pack of nasi lemak would cost roughly around two ringgit to two ringgit fifty cents. If I were in UPM, it would cost me at least ten ringgit a day for food alone. You can definitely see the contrast there. Ten ringgit a day compared to ten years ago, where Ten ringgit would be enough for a week. All right, so that is all the reason as to why you should start investing today to have money in the future and also to avoid inflation. Uh, next slide. Types of investment. Now you must be wondering how to start investing or or where should I start investing. Well, there's three types of investment the way I see it. Low risk investment, medium risk investment, and high risk investment. Do note that the higher the higher the risk, the higher the return the investment will be. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, pretty sure everyone wants that high return. However, the higher the return also means the higher the chances of you losing your money. So, so which type of investment should you go for? Well, the type of investment that you should go for has to be according to your very own personal goals and target. Uh, next slide. Okay, low risk investment. Now let's talk about the first type of investment, which is the low risk investment. Um, in my opinion, low risk investment is very suitable for those who who wants to invest in a long period of time. For example, if you want to save your money for your wedding or for your retirement, let's say forty years time. Okay, because I'm twenty one right now. And the minimum requirement which for retiring in Malaysia is 60. So let's say I want, I want to invest my money for the next 40 years. The reason I'm saying that low, low risk investment is the best investment if you want to go long term is because the risk of you actually, actually losing your money that you have um, saved for the past 40 years is very, very low. Just now I said high risk, high return, right? Same thing applies to this. So low risk, low return but also low chances of you losing your money. Let's say, let's say you choose the wrong type of investment. Let's say you choose to invest in a high risk investment for, for the next 40 years. High risk investment means the risk of you losing your money is very high, which means that all the money that you have saved for the past 40 years could be gone. Let's say, let's say you're retired and you plan on using the money that you have invested in the, in, in the high risk investment for the past 40 years. Then all of a sudden the, the stock market crash, everything went down. So all of the money that you have invested in stocks are gone. Imagine losing your entire saving of 40 years. That is very painful. Hence why you should at least, at least invest some of your money in the low risk investment. Some might say low risk investment is very imperative, almost acts as a backup. It's almost as if, as if you save your money in the bank itself, but with a higher annual return. So as you can see on your screen, there are three types of examples for a, a low risk investment um, ASB, which is Amana Saham Bumi Putra, Gold and Robot Advisor. Uh, I'm only going to cover about Robot Advisor for this one because it's the only low risk investment that I myself have personally used. The first one that I will be talking about is um, Robot Advisor since this is, I, I think this is the easiest to understand. So what is a Robot Advisor? Robot Advisor is basically an app, an app on your phone where AI, which is um, artificial intelligence, they will invest your money for you. So for those of you who are either too lazy to study about the stock market or just don't have any knowledge about investing but still want to invest, then Robot Advisor is by far the best choice for you. There are a few Robot Advisors that are legal in Malaysia but the most common ones are Wahid Invest and Stashway. So for those of you who are wondering, why is there two robot advisors app if both of them are going to do the same job? I mean, both of these robot advisors apps are going to have AI investing in money, right? So what is it that one of these apps have that the other doesn't? Well, I'm going to tell you the difference between these two apps and then you can uh, decide for yourself which one of these apps is uh, much more suitable for you. Uh, next slide. 
Okay. The most obvious one, which is Wahid Invest and Stashway. The most obvious one is Wahid Invest is much more Muslim friendly compared to Stashway. Uh, the name Wahid itself is already in Arabic, which means one. So does it really matter if one of the advisor is Muslim friendly and the other is not? Well, if you're a Muslim, yeah, yes, yes, it does. It does matter. It matters a lot, actually. I remember when I said that robot advisor will invest your money for you, which means that they will have full control of your money. The AI will choose their own stocks to invest your money in. <coughs> Here is where the Muslim friendly part is important for us Muslim. Since you have no control whatsoever with your, with your money, the AI will invest in various kinds of stocks such as Apple, Google, Facebook, um, etc. Which means that they can also invest in stocks that are haram. There are haram stocks. Yes, there is. Stocks are considered considered haram when they have anything to do with alcoholic beverages, um, cannabis, weapons, and drugs. So that's like the most obvious differences between these two apps. Now let's see other differences that, that these two apps bring to its users. Okay, from the table you can see that um, Stashway is a robot advisor platform that was created in Singapore and it has been around since 2016. Stashway got famous in 2018 when it became the first platform to obtain a digital investment management license from our Malaysian Securities Commission. Wahid, however, got famous a year later in 2019 when it became the world's first Islamic robot advisor and was awarded the first Islamic digital investment management license in Malaysia. Um, in case you're wondering, is it safe? Is it safe for you to, to invest or put your money uh, in an app for the next 10 to 20 years? These licenses are actually very important for you to find out whether the company or the app that you're using to invest is safe or not. So if you come across an investment and they don't have any license provided by the Malaysia Securities Commission, then you should definitely avoid them as it might be a scam for you. Since both Stashway and Wahid have a very own license provided by the Malaysia Securities Commission, then yes, both of these apps are completely safe. Next thing, both Wahid and Stashway have apps which you can download in the App Store or the Google Play Store in a, if you're using an Android. However, only Stashway has a desktop version whereas Wahid does not. So if you or your parent prefer to see and analyze your, your investment on a much bigger screen, then Stashway is definitely the perfect choice for you. Next, what about the fees? Do you have to pay extra fees to use the service? Absolutely not. Both Wahid and Stashway have zero registration fees and registration and exit fees, which means when you sign up, you don't have to pay extra just to use the services. Same goes to um, when you no longer want to invest in robot advisor. Let's say you're, you're much interested in cryptocurrency now. Then you can withdraw all your money from the robot advisor to your bank account with zero fees. So no extra charges will be deducted from the investment. Now, a lot of you may be wondering how much do how much money do I need in order to start investing in the in the robot advisor? Well, stashaway for stashaway, there is no minimum deposit, which means you can start your investment with as low as one ringgit. This, however, does not apply when it comes to working invest, as the minimum deposit for it is 100 which means in order for you to get started with Wahid Invest, you're going to need to have at least 100 ringgit with you. Last but not least, the risk portfolio that these two apps offer are also different in a way. For example, Stashway has a risk portfolio starting from 6.5% to 36%. Do note that the higher the risk we're taking, the higher the profit will gain. However, as you take higher and higher risk, the risk of you losing your money is also very high. So if you don't want to lose a lot of your money, but at the same time you still want to gain, you still want to gain profit, then the lower lower risk profile should work just fine for you. Same thing goes to Wahid. They offer a portfolio range from gold to very aggressive, where gold is the lowest risk you can take, and very aggressive is the highest risk. So final verdict: which one is better, Wahid Invest or Stash Rate? Me personally, as a Muslim, I myself invest in Wahid Invest. And it is advisable for other Muslims to do the same as well. If you invest in Wahid, then you don't have to worry about the halal and haram stocks as 
Wahid is 100% Sharia compliance. As for uh, non-Muslims, uh, this is a benefit for you guys. Just you can change in between these two apps whenever you feel like. If you tried Wahid for a few months and then you just you just don't like Wahid, then maybe you can you prefer to use the desktop version of the app. Then you can definitely switch to stash weight right away with zero fees. Next slide. Medium and high risk investment. Next is the medium and high risk investment, which is which is um, stocks and cryptocurrency. Between stocks and crypto, I would say crypto is the higher is the higher risk than stocks solely because um crypto market is much more volatile than the stock market. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone here have heard of cryptocurrency or in short crypto before. So what is crypto and why is it getting more and more attention? Why is everyone talking about crypto nowadays? And and, and I'm pretty sure you've heard at least one news um, regarding about crypto this okay. year. Okay, so what is crypto and how can crypto shape our future? Well, to explain that, we need to see how the world's first cryptocurrency, which is uh, Bitcoin, was created in the first place and why was it created. Let's see how traditional money works first. Okay, so the money that we use today, our, our Ringgit Malaysia, is controlled and monitored by the government through central bank. This means that the government is responsible for printing the money, which means that they can print money whenever they seem fit. If the government needs more money, they can just they can just print it. Right. So, so 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 why don't they why don't they print more money? We all know that our Malaysian economy nowadays is not is not at its strongest, let's say. So so why don't the current government just print more money to fix that? Okay, there's a reason and there's also a history why. Back back in 2008, there was a huge financial crisis and the US government they needed more money in order to overcome that uh, this financial crisis. So so what did they do? They they went they went ahead and print a lot of, a lot more money because they thought by printing more money the crisis would be solved. And then, okay, unfortunately, everything in this world follows the law of supply and demand. Okay, everything, even currency as well. So the law states that as the supply of an item increases, the value of it will decrease. As the supply of the item decreases, the value of the item will increase. To explain it back to let, let's let's picture a situation. Let's say let's say you're locked in a room with ten people for hours and was given only one water bottle to survive. Obviously, now the water bottle is the most um, valuable thing in the room because all all of you would need water in order to survive being in that room. Here, the water bottle is the item, and since there is only one item, the value of it increased tremendously, which means how you would distribute water, how many sips that each person gets is very important because every drop, every drop comes since you only have one water bottle in that room. Now, let's say you increase the, the supply. Let's say you're in the same room with the same 10 people, but now you are given 100 water bottles. So if the supply of the item is greatly increased, what would happen to the value? The value will then decrease. For example, hundred water bottles, right? So each person gets roughly um, ten bottles. The value of each bottle now has greatly decreased to the point that you can throw away half of the water bottle, and all ten of you would still survive just fine in that room. If you throw away half, is let's say you have one hundred, and then you throw away half, you're left with fifty water bottles. And I'm pretty sure fifty is more than enough for ten people to survive. This is exactly how inflation works. Why can't everyone afford a sports car? Because not everyone has the amount of money to buy one. Therefore, the value of a sports car like a Lamborghini is very high. What if every single person in Malaysia are given 5 million ringgit each? Can everyone buy a Lamborghini now? Yes. Will the, will the Lamborghini be valuable? No. You would see tens or maybe hundreds of Lamborghinis on the road. Everyone driving one. So the Lamborghini itself is no longer valuable. Uh, okay, so back to our history lessons. In 2008, US printed a lot more money to overcome the financial crisis, which leads to an inflation that was so big, it, it, it would have collapsed the whole country. This type of inflation is called hyperinflation. Now, we know whoever is in charge of manipulating the currency is technically in charge of the, the country. 
So who is in charge of manipulating the currency? Uh, it's the government, the government, which means uh, if our government were to cause an inflation or a hyperinflation, then the whole country could collapse. Now, we can see how unstable the traditional currency is. If one day the government decides to print more money, hyperinflation happens, then all of the money that you have will lose its value, which means that there is no use. Imagine having a thousand ringgit, but that thousand ringgit holds no value, which means that you cannot use the money. Right, so if traditional currency is not stable, then what is? Now, this is where Bitcoin um, steps in. In 2008, a person that goes by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto introduces the world to Bitcoin, the first ever cryptocurrency and also the first digital currency system. Satoshi wanted to create a currency that is not controlled by the bank or by the government or by, by anyone else. Because as you all know, humans, they, they tend to be greedy when it comes to money. There is even a saying that says money is the root of all evil, which means that the, the desire to obtain more money usually is the reason that humans do evil things to one another. Bitcoin, however, is not controlled by the government or by the bank or by anyone. Bitcoin uses a system called the blockchain to operate, which means it does not need humans to operate. Since Bitcoin is not controlled by anyone, then surely there's a lot of benefits that comes with it, right? Um, yes, there, there's, a lot, there's a few benefits that you can obtain by using cryptocurrencies. And okay, for starters, if you usually do a transaction with the you're buying an item online or you're using credit card to pay for your meal, there is always a middleman such as banks, brokers, and agents that will take your money and then give it to the other person. This middleman, uh, the banks, they will then charge an extra fees to you since you're asking them to transfer the money for you. This fees will be charged in various types of fees, various types such as processing fees, annual fees, and so on. With cryptocurrency, however, the middleman is completely removed. Just now, like I said, cryptocurrency is not controlled by the government nor the bank. So now that the middleman has been removed, the transaction fees are either greatly reduced or completely eliminated, which means you don't have to pay an extra fees when doing a transaction. Um, now the second benefit that uh, the cryptocurrencies have is that the transaction fees for international transfer is very cheap compared to the normal ones. This is because um, the transaction does not involve government to pass through and you don't have to pay any third party to convert your money for you. This is very beneficial for someone who needs to constantly transfer money to a friend or a family member overseas. Let's say, let's say you're studying abroad and your parent wants to give you monthly expenses. Then cryptocurrencies is definitely the best platform for them. The third benefit that I see coming from cryptocurrency is that the transaction is very easy and very quick. With traditional currency, there's sometimes fees, there's paperwork, all because you want to send your money, all because you want to send money to your friends abroad. To some of you, it may seem uh, like a fuss. Well, in cryptocurrency, you don't have to worry about any of those anymore because now you're dealing directly with the person you're conducting the transactions with. Also, certain bank that would take up to half a day or maybe even a day if you want to transfer your money to someone overseas. Cryptocurrencies can do the exact same thing but only within minutes. Nowadays, more and more companies are accepting crypto as a form of payment. And recently, even Tesla has announced that you can buy a Tesla car using Bitcoin. This is where crypto are considered to be the future currency for us. And it's like my personal uh, experience with investing. Okay, I myself invest in each type of investment. Uh, for low risk investment, I use Wahid Invest simply because it is um, Sharia compliance, which means I no longer have to worry about my money in investing into stocks that are haram or not Sharia. Since the risk level is low, my gains also has been low as expected. I only started investing in Wahid since last month because I was too busy focusing on crypto during these past few months. But then I realized how volatile the crypto market is and I could possibly lose all my money if the market went crashing down. So I thought that I would invest in these low things investment as well so that if I were to lose my money, I would not lose all of them. I would still have my emergency funds in what we invest. In three months of investing in crypto, I have seen and experienced a lot of things. Um, the market in crypto is very, very volatile. 
one day I woke up and checked my crypto account, I gained about 50% profit. Then the following week, I would lost about 60%. This is because crypto is considered uh, to be a high risk investment, which means you can easily gain profit, but also easily lose some. The basic thing in crypto for those who are new is basically um, to buy the coin when the price is low and sell it when the price is high. This is known as buying the dip in crypto market when you would buy the coin when the coin is experiencing a loss, which, is, which means when the price is low. Besides buying the dip, there is also a well-known term in crypto market which is FOMO. FOMO stands for fear of missing out where, where you see a coin going up in prices, so you, you decided to buy that coin. One thing I've learned uh, in these past few months is to never do that because from what I've seen, every coin they will eventually go back down again. And when they do, that's when you buy it. You don't buy when the coin is going up. So this is why crypto market is said to be very volatile. The coin, the coin goes up and down very easily. So my advice to you is to start investing today. Um, start with the low risk investment first before going to the high risk investment. But do not put all your money in your investment. Do save some of your money in the bank in case of emergency. In terms of long term investment, invest is definitely a must especially for the youth it is still considered not too late to invest especially during our 20s actually for especially for those of you who just received your great idea instead of putting it in the bank and letting it sit there do take some of the money and start investing in the future um, that is all that i can explain about investing today and thank you for listening Thank you, Zara. A very good morning to everyone. I hope everyone is having a good day so far. My name is Victoria Clarissa Binti Julin, and my topic for today is my journey in investing as a university student or a young adult. Uh, keep in mind that I'm no financial advisor, so um, always do your research first and. Uh, what I'm saying is based on my experience and it's no financial advice. Okay, uh, to start off, I am pretty sure that I am among the minority of students my age who are managing their own finances. Seriously, like seriously fa uh, managing finances. So I am grateful uh, that my parents have taught me to be more frugal and be more responsible in myself uh, financial management. Now that I am at the right, right age of 20, I, I tend to explore more into the world of investing and I will be sharing my two cents as a novice investor. First and foremost, I asked myself, why am I investing? Of course I have more money, but then, but then on a more serious note, knowing why I needed to invest or the objective and goals I have in investing is highly essential in handling the rest of the problems I have later on. These are the three main reasons why I am invest investing. First, to make my money work for me. Second, to multiply my savings for future use. And thirdly, to be financially independent as early as possible. To make my money work for me. This phrase was strong enough to convince myself to take the risk and invest because I am a full-time student and working part-time or full-time is extremely out of reach in my current situation. I put my money into investment platforms so that it will grow and multiply every day and also prevent me from spending unnecessarily on Shopee and Lazada. This brings me to my second reason, to multiply my savings for future use. You see, I get sick quite easily and due to the current COVID situation, going to the public hospital is too risky because there's a lot of uh, COVID exposure over there. So I had to go to private hospitals to get treatment for health purposes, especially the reason why I started investing is because Health is wealth. Other than that, university isn't that cheap either. Being a mechanical engineering student, I have to spend 
a lot, a lot, a lot of money on services, books, and necessary equipments. Like, it's so, so, so expensive. So I always have to be prepared financially for those things. And also, again, due to COVID, these things get more expensive because shipping to Sarawak is so, so expensive. Lala harga barang naik, harga shipping pun macam haram. And my third reason is to be financially independent as early as possible. Investing allows you to reach financial freedom because you can multiply your money every day. Therefore, allowing you to be more to be dependent financially because you can start paying for your own needs and necessities. Next slide. Okay, these are my main perf investment portfolios. My main investment portfolios are in these two sites, Wahid Invest and uh, Luno. I chose to use Wahid Invest because it's a robot advisor, which means I don't have to analyze specific, specific charts every day or watch analytical videos to determine when, when to buy and when to sell stocks. It's a halal investment platform, which means their investment portfolios are comprised of Jaya compliant stocks, which doesn't include stocks from companies that sell, for example, tobacco, alcohol, firearms, gambling, adult entertainment, impure food, impure food stock, and usurious uh, institutions. What I like about using Wahid Invest is that it is ethical. When I first started to, like, when I first wanted to invest, I had to make sure that I was investing the right things because investing the right things means that you are supporting the companies that offer those stocks. Since it is a Sharia compliant, it, since it is Sharia compliant in its services and offerings, I thought it would be a great start for someone who doesn't know how to do technical analysis or someone who doesn't know how to handle multiple individual stocks at a time. So it was safe and it ensures returns in my investment. And I would consider this platform as a low risk investment as it is not extremely volatile, plus it is professionally managed by fund managers. Last but not least about what he invests is that it is a licensed robot advisor by the Malaysian Securities Commission, which means it is regulated in our country, so it is safe to use. My second investment portfolio is in LUNO, which is a cryptocurrency exchange that connects buyers with sellers of cryptocurrencies. One important thing to take note uh, when choosing investment platform is to make sure to make sure it is licensed by the Malaysian Securities Commission Commission to protect your investments as the Malaysian Securities Commission is the authority in Malaysia that is assigned to regulate these investment platforms. Nuno is one of the three cryptocurrencies exchanges that uh, is regulated by the Malaysian Securities Commission and the other two are Tokenize and Synergy. Many people that I know who invest in cryptocurrency choose to invest in digital, in cryptocurrencies on platforms that are not regulated by this authority because a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies, there's a lot of types of cryptocurrencies and most of these currencies are only available on sites that are not regulated by the, this authority. Therefore, like it causes them to be more at risk through scams, disappearance of assets, and many other unwanted consequences. So when dealing with your hard-earned money, always make sure to do your research first, especially if it's a, a digital asset like cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is relatively new and it is advancing extremely fast, which makes it extremely volatile at the same time. Like, it can like go up and down 50% in a day like that. Okay. In my opinion, I would not invest more than 
of my own savings into a market that is volatile, like cryptocurrency. You must wonder, why do I invest in cryptocurrency despite choosing, choosing to be ethical in my investment? There are certain cryptocurrencies that support the advancements of um, revolutionary blockchains that are eco-friendly and has the technology to provide extremely fast uh, transactions. Bitcoin is one of the most fuel consuming uh, cryptocurrency because it requires a lot of fuel to mine Bitcoin. And there I say it is the least eco-friendly uh, cryptocurrency. The mining of Bitcoin is high in carbon footprint, which is definitely not good for the environment. Whereas uh, cryptocurrencies like Ripple XRP consumes low energy in mining because it is well, I mean, it makes, it's more energy efficient la, the, than Bitcoin. So, Ripple XRP is one of the most advanced uh, blockchain technology in the, for global payments, which allows people and SMEs to have better access to, uh, to have access to better financial services. Okay, uh, I like the concept of Ripple XRP because it is low in energy consumption in mining. Therefore, I choose to invest mainly in Ripple XRP. Of course, there are many other great cryptocurrencies out there that are environmentally conscious and offer great services though through like techn technological advancement, but sadly, they are not available in Luno. The only cryptocurrencies available on Luno are Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Ripple XRP. I would love to try out uh, other platforms in the future, but for now, I'm just going to stay safe with Luno, plus the interface is very user-friendly. Next slide. Okay, this is my investment timeline. I started using Wahid Invest in March 2020 which was in the beginning of the pandemic and I was not careful with my decisions. I was also unaware of happenings in my environment, such as how the economy will be affected by the pandemic and how the society would react to it. At the same time, it was, uh, I would say it was a bad time to start using Wahid Invest. However, if I had waited until May or April, I would have bought stocks at a lower price. So, uh, due to MCO, the stocks of majority of companies in my portfolio were down, so my returns were ne negative, uh, which means the total money that I had invested had decreased. So now, since the economy had some time to recover, I also changed my portfolio to very aggressive. So my returns, my current returns are at 8% which is really good to me, considering that the pandemic is still going strong. I'm not very worried about um, my investments in Wahid Invest, as it is professionally managed by uh, a lot of fund managers. So my investments are mostly in Wahid. Next, I started to use Luno back in November 2020, because I wanted to invest more in technology since I'm a mechanical engineering student and to be honest, trading cryptocurrency is very, very, very hard as it is very volatile. It also It's also affected by random cryptocurrency tweets by Elon Musk uh, as he is the most influential person in the crypto world. There has been extreme ups and downs because of him and it has caused unnatural fluctuations and decline in the cryptocurrency prices, thus creating unexpected bull runs or bear runs throughout my investing, my time investing in cryptocurrencies. Next slide. Okay, know your jargons. Uh, next, I mean, uh, we have some common jargons in use in investing. So when you start investing without knowing some, some terms, you get very confused and very lost. So to be honest, the first jargon I learned was FOMO, which is fear of missing out. 
this have caused me to like impulsive, impulsively sell and or buy stocks. And it was really damaging to my investments because it has caused me to lose a lot of money due to inconsistent risk management. Anyways, there, here are some uh, few jargons to know before investing. Bearish is basically the period of time when uh, the prices of stocks will drop. And bullish is the period of time when the prices of stocks will increase. Growth, growth share are company shares that uh, en enable workers to become stakeholders on the terms that can be customized by uh, their own company to provide an attractive opportunity, I would say, to increase the company's value. Blue chip stocks are basically stocks from companies that has uh, a national reputation in for its consistency, reliability, and ability to work profitably in both good times and bad times. Last but not least, income share is a type of equity security which provides regular dividends to the shareholders of the company. Next slide. Okay, emotions during investing. I would say these are the four main emotions I uh, experience during investing. The first one being formal buying and selling. Second is anger. Third is sadness. And fourth is euphoria. Formal buying and selling is because of news and uh, rumors. These uh, news and rumors can cause you to like suddenly sell or uh, buy more stocks because it is your reaction to those news and it's actually very damaging because you are not following a good plan in your investing uh, routine. Second is anger. Oh, I experience a lot of anger, especially when Elon Musk tweets because whenever he tweets something about cryptocurrency, it basically affects the whole market of cryptocurrency. Even though uh, Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency that's uh, available to, that has the ability to purchase Tesla, something like that. Uh, I mean, Elon Musk shouldn't be, be that influential in the crypto world, basically. But whenever he tweets something about cryptocurrency, it makes me very angry because people start selling, people start buying. Uh, for more buying and selling like that. Okay, the other one is sadness. Uh, now the cryptocurrency world, the cryptocurrency um, uh, ecosystem is basically down. Everything is bearish and it's like, it's, it's, it's reaching the lowest Fibonacci uh, levels. And to be honest, I'm quite sad, <laughs> but well, it is what it is. It's very volatile. So. It was the risk I had to take. Fourth is euphoria. Euphoria is when uh, you feel a lot, you feel very positive and very happy, you know, towards something. And to be honest, euphoria is one of the most dangerous uh, emotion to feel during investing. <laughs> you have to try to keep neutral as, as neutral as possible when investing because like, okay, for euphoria, Whenever it's a bullish period, uh, the prices of cryptocurrencies or stocks, it will go up and you will be like, oh, it will go up, it will go up even more. So you, you don't take your profits until like you, until it goes higher, higher, higher. But the reality is it won't go very, very, very high in like in immediate period. So euphoria has caused me to lose a lot of money because I didn't take profits at the right levels, which is, um, very bad because I keep on losing money because of that. So yeah, try to control your uh, euphoric emotions, especially during bullish periods. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, here are some self reminders for myself. Uh, you can take this as your own self reminder as well if you find it uh, suitable for you for you in investing okay 
First is to st st oh my god, okay, sorry. To set stop losses. Stop losses allows you prevents you from losing uh too much money and by setting stop losses you are it means that you're going to be you're still going to be comfortable at the amount you're losing that uh certain level of stop loss. So you wouldn't uh I would say you wouldn't lose too much money if you set your own stop losses. Second is to choose the right trading platform, choosing the best um, interface or uh, the investment, the things you want to invest in is available on these trading platforms. Uh, it's very important to choose those kind of things because it is going to affect you in the long run, especially if you're uh, going to hold on to those stocks or those cryptocurrencies in the long term. So choosing the right trading platform that are regulated is to be highly is highly essential. Okay, third one is to be aware of current news. Current news it affects the economy economy a lot. And like let's say if Tesla wants to sell Bitcoin or Tesla wants to buy more Bitcoin, it's going those kind of news uh they are going to like affect the in, your investments a lot. So always keep up with current news and stuff. And like maybe there will be technological advancements in this certain blockchain, and it's going to cost this certain cryptocurrency to go up or, or down like that. So you have to know about those things. Fourth is to have a plan for bull runs and bear runs. Having a plan for bull runs and bear runs won't make you FOMO buy or sell. So it keeps your risk management at bay. So safer, lah, to be honest. Okay, uh, the fifth one is to make, to design your portfolio more thoroughly because if your portfolio is more thoroughly designed, uh, it means that you're supporting the right invest, the right companies, the right stocks, and you can choose the safe stocks or you can choose the really volatile ones. Okay, last but not least, always make sure to have less than 50% of your savings, especially in a very volatile market. Let's say you have 50% 50, uh, 50 of your savings in Wahid Invest. Uh, Wahid Invest is still considered low risk, so that's safe. But if you have more like 50% or more of your savings in your cryptocurrency bag, it's going to be very dangerous and you're bound to lose a lot, a lot, a lot more money. Okay. So uh, that is all from me. Thank you. All right. So um, I think before I get started, I just have to remind the technical team to just uh, give me a heads up if I, in the event that I do get disconnected, so, so that it's easier for me to, to reconnect. All right. So uh, hi guys, my name is Sanjay Long. So today I'm going to be sharing about my personal experience with managing my personal finances. Um, so my topic is going to be a little bit uh, shorter, like in terms of my content, and it's going to be a little bit more intuitive compared to the previous speakers uh, that were a little bit more technical. But I do have to acknowledge that the previous speakers before me did a really good presentations on um, how investing works and like things like cryptocurrency and why they're the trend now. Uh, yeah, so even I myself am fascinated by cryptocurrency, but I just couldn't be bothered to care about them. So, um, yeah, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that uh, global technology is evolving at a really fast pace. So if you guys want to hop on the bandwagon, so just go, right? Yeah, so first of all, I think being able to invest requires um, a shrewd acumen, and you have to be able to make judgments just based on um, the situation itself. So these requisite traits, they require training and they require um, exposure to real life instances where you have to make decisions just based on uh, like your personal finances. Like which is why I'm I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about my personal experience taking stock of my own finances, which is basically means um, taking care of my own uh, personal finances. Uh, but before we get started, I just have to establish from the get go that I am not a financial advisor, nor do I represent um, any financial firms. So anything I'll be speaking about today is merely based on my survival experience uh, uh, being a university student. So um, 
And also note that this forum is a service learning project in which students are required to hold a forum or sharing session, whatever you want to call it, and reach out to the community. So whatever that we said uh, that we're going to say, uh, that we're going to talk about in this forum, just take it at face value, right? So yeah, so without further ado, let's get started on the first slide. Next. So firstly, let's look at some statistics. Um, this is a report by Monday Matters, the Money Matters in 2019, which shows that um, college students are quite susceptible, uh, usually susceptible to false financial debt. So um, this is actually attributable to the severe case of financial illiteracy among college students. And um, it is also because of their inability to cope with this so responsibly that they just take it up, meaning like they just become adults, right? And then they're suddenly given credit cards. So that like literally means they're suddenly given this purchasing power and they don't know how to use it responsibly. So, it is very likely for them to abuse that purchasing power that they're just given. Yeah. So this happens without prior experience or like a proper guidance from their parents. And um, so it's very easy for them to make irrational, financially ill-advised judgments and decisions, which in the long run will only hurt their financial health, which as you can see, they fall into financial debt, you know, at the college level. So when you look at these numbers, right, like 53% and 36%, um, it's, it's really alarming to think that so many college students are under-equipped when it comes to um, managing their finances or just taking care of themselves. Uh, next slide. So which is why it's very important for us to be able to manage our own finances. I think at this point where you're able to manage your finances, it will be easier for you to be uh, dealing with your future financial responsibilities and roles such as filing your tax return or um, even paying a student loan on time. So these things will require you to make um, decisions in an instant. And I think you'll also get acquainted with managing your personal capital or maybe expanding your personal portfolio if you're keen on investing. And I think being in control of your personal finances really um, really does open up a multitude of opportunities for you. Uh, like uh, there's always that learning curve when you can always improve yourself. Um, and I think secondly, you will also be able to train yourself uh, to organize the finances in such a way that you're aware of every movement of your money, like uh, literally the movement of your money, like where you spend your money and um, like like what is your income for this month and like, yeah, just basically stuff like that. And then um, it then becomes easier for you to track your finances, uh, like if you keep track of the movement of your money. So, and last but not least, I think you will also be able to save up for times of emergency. So we can always predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Like, you don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. So you always want to be ready. You always want to be um, 10 years ahead of you financially. So um, it, is always, it is always well advised to stash away a sum of money that you can always um, put to use when you need them, like in times of emergency. So we've basically established why it's important to be in control of your finances and why it's crucial and imperative to track your finances and just basically why it is of um, paramount importance for you to control your money, uh, to put it in the simplest term. And then um, now we're going to talk about ways that can help us manage and organize uh, our finances. And again, I have to reiterate that I'm not a financial advisor. And so these are like daily tips that I've learned which I find incredibly useful, you know, when it comes to managing my finances um, and helping me compartmentalize my stuff so that I can keep track of, like, you know, my money. And then, um, but also the practicality of these tips that I'm going really to that I'm going to be sharing, um, they may vary from person to person, but I think in most instances they'll surely help you in managing your finances. Yeah. So next slide. Uh, so the first one is spreadsheets. So I find uh, spreadsheets incredibly tremendously powerful and handy when you don't want to carry on a physical planner. But I don't think anyone carries around like a physical planner nowadays. Yeah. So I think by using Microsoft Excel or Google Sheet, like anything that can help you create like a, a spreadsheet lab. Like you can create a financial planner where you're going to list down all things related to um uh to your finances to a T, meaning like in a very minute detail. So um and then with spreadsheets, you can also keep track of your long-term financial goals, such as, like for example, you want to be financially independent, right? And then you want to save up a certain amount of money over a period of time. And then these, uh, like a spreadsheet will always remind you of these goals that you have. And then, uh, but I mean, of course, there are apps that you can use. I think I used one app before, but I forgot the name of that app. 
But um, I think, but I think personally, for me, spreadsheets are, uh, of course, uh, I mean, just spreadsheets just feel completely different. Like, in the sense that um, you're actually creating your own planner and you're putting values into it. So, um, like, you can have a spreadsheet that is explosively colorful or a spreadsheet that is so simple and so intuitive. But, um, but I think at the same time. Like it just depends on it depends on it depends on your convenience, and I like apps. I think it's actually just feels more personal because you create this planner, like I said, and then you put values into it, and then um, I think that makes it all the more meaningful to me. But that doesn't take away from the from the practicality and superior convenience of these apps that you have in your phone. Uh, I think a spreadsheet. I think I think you can still explore potential data on those apps into a spreadsheet, and you can still see them like maybe in a more detailed manner, but. Um, yeah, like, so anything that works for you, anything that's super convenient, just use them, like, no one's really going to care. And um, basically, at the end of every month, when you look back on your spreadsheets, you're going to see how much money you spend or how much you have saved. And I think these are very um, instrumental in helping you decide where your goals are next month or the next time around when you restart your planner. Uh, next slide. I think uh, the following two slides are going to be an example of how I do mine. So my my planner is really simple and intuitive. I categorize my expenses and like list down the projected cost, which is like the cost or the, the cost that I expect to spend, and the actual cost, which is like uh, the actual amount of money that I spend that month. So you don't actually have to list down every transaction. You make a daily basis. So like if something as cheap as like one ringgit, you don't really have to. I feel like you don't really have to like list them down, but you know, the individual itself. So, and I do like, like basically what I do is I count in general. Like, for example, I usually spend like 10 minutes per day on meals. So I multiply that by how many days in a month. And like, that's the amount of money that I expect to spend on food. Yeah. And then, like, for things like fast food and snacks, uh, I've basically allocated a certain amount of money for that as well. So, like, um, I, I try to spend as close to the amount as possible and try not to overspend. Yeah, so like basically your plan is going to be something like, some, it's going to be like a rough approximation of how much you spend in that month. Like it just keeps track of your budget as well as where your money goes. Um, next slide. Uh, skip. Uh, yeah, so I think this one is really important as well. So let's talk about um, frugality. So what does it mean to be frugal? It just means um, being budget much or much, like you don't borrow stuff for blanja like literally. So, but I think like we have to ask ourselves questions. Are you frugal? Like is everyone frugal? Like why is it so hard to be frugal? So I think the point at which you are still financially dependent upon your parents, it's essential for you to be uh, like, not necessarily your parents are like your siblings or so. Like I think it's very important for you uh, you know, to want to be frugal, especially when you don't have an account. It's prudent and well advised for you to be uh, frugal in the sense that, um, like, like you're self-aware, like, you, like you know that the money that you spend is not your money. So you're self-aware and you know that if you overspend, it's going to it's going to hurt your parents. It's not going to hurt you. Yeah. So especially when you're an university student, I think uh, you're far away from your family, and then like sometimes you want to follow your friends, like. Whatever your friends do, you want to do as well. And then wherever your friends go, you want to go as well. So, I mean, it's normal to feel that way. It's normal to want to do those things. But I think at the same time, you still have to practice some form of self-control. And that self-control is like being true girl. Yeah. So uh, these things that I've listed here are things that I can think about. Uh, and I think you can think about these things as well when you want to spend. Um, but they're not necessarily like, Tips per se, like, I think, but I think they're quite important in helping you become more frugal. Like, yeah, like these are just aspects of frugality that you can think about. Uh, for example, uh, when you want to buy something, right? Like, you first have to assess and gauge the degree of its necessity, like in a sense, like an immediacy uh, relative to your uh, financial situation at that moment. Like, uh, okay, to contextualize that, uh, for example, every week you're given one during a month, and then. Uh, that one day you get expensive to last a whole week. And then you want to go to the mall, and then you see an item that you like, which happens to be worth um, 80 ringgit. So in that situation, you're going to assess the degree of its necessity and immediacy, and you're going to ask yourself questions like, um, 
is this necessary right now? Like, is it something that I really need right now? Um, is it needed immediately or urgently? So just having these thought processes means you're carefully planning your spending and your finances. And um, I think a rational and uh, a mentally sound person would not search on an item immediately in that moment, like on Monday, um, and stuff himself for the rest of the week. So um, I think essentially knowing what to spend your money on and when to spend those money are signs of like, or rather the, the action of being frugal. Yeah, and then secondarily, I think we also have to address the fact that many of us make purchases compulsively. I think this happens to a lot of people, including myself as well. So this is due to the fact that our brains are way to yearn desperately for that for those shots of uh, what is that analogy term? Uh, serotonin. Yeah, that's that's where your body when you make a purchase, meaning you know, like you feel excited and you feel stoked when you buy something. So this is best defined as um, an instant gratification. So for example. Uh, you're going through a bad day, right? And then you just feel bored and uh, there's nothing better to do than scroll through your Shopee app or your Zillow app. And then, like, if you're the kind of person who has the propensity to, to yield to that urge, it's very easy for you to fall for it. Like, it's very easy for you to make purchases compulsively. So, as time goes by, your vegetation rights want to feel that instant gratification that purchasing something on impulse brings. And then, like, uh, like it's very easy for you to, to encounter problems when it comes to your financial uh, situation. So suffice it to say, if you feel bored or if you're just like you just have something to do, just don't go to, uh, just don't go on those apps or like, just don't go on, right? Yeah, and then um, furthermore, I think um, the third one is practicality of a, a strategy. I think this is worth mentioning as well. Um, this I think this encompasses a lot of aspects in our lives. So to make you understand what this means. Uh, let's just imagine two pairs of shoes. A pair is from Bata and another pair is from like maybe Yeezy, so like some of the luxury brand up. Um, and like nonetheless, that's not the same purpose, uh, which is to protect your feet and to provide you with comfort. And but though the Bata is slightly less visually striking uh, compared to the Yeezy compared to the Yeezy pair, um, so this concerns the topics. Like oftentimes you buy a pair of shoes because it looks like, but things that are usually visually distinct. Uh, or like things that are, or things that look nice in general, they're always expensive. So, and another thing is that our decision to buy something, or the internal judgment that precedes the decision to buy something, um, it is always like it is most of the time influenced by what we think other people will think. Meaning, when when we buy a pair of shoes, we want people to look at it and say that, um, oh, he's wearing the new pair of Yeezys and he's keeping up with the trend. I think. Like everyone is felt that way at one point or another, and I think it's bad because like um, what people think of us shouldn't come at the expense of our financial health. And I think uh, at the same time, um, yeah. And then you also have to think about the personal benefits with, uh, that you will gain from like making a purchase. So a rule of thumb is that um, if the benefits are temporary, then it's not really worth buying. Like meaning, if the benefits that come with purchasing that uh, item it's only going to last a short amount of time, so like it's not really worth buying. Yeah. So next slide. Uh, I think, so to briefly wrap things up, uh, to wrap this form up, I think the whole thing wouldn't have been possible uh, without like some form of self-control, which uh, brings us to self-discipline. So if you're going to control yourself, or like if you're constant, like if you cannot like constantly remind yourself of your goals, then this whole form like is futile and pointless. Uh, I think it has to come from within yourself to want to control your life. It has to come from within yourself to want to take stock of your finances. And um, no one owes you like anything to have to keep your money to take stock of, to take stock of your personal finances. So, and you're certainly not adapted to anyone to take care of your personal finances. But I think the repercussions are, are going to be severe if you don't take uh, if you don't take control of your finances like right now. Um, and again, why is taking care of your personal finances so important? Trust me, like you're going to feel so good about yourself because having something as complicated as personal finances under control it just imbues you with this like feeling of being accomplished, this feeling of like greater sense of control of yourself when you slowly achieve your goals. So, but then again, it's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong learning process. There are always, there are always going to be learning curves, and you're always going to have to improve. You're always going to have to adapt. Um, so, 
and I think being patient really goes a long way. Uh, but I think what's really important is the accumulation of wisdom and knowledge along the journey, which I believe is an, uh, is an essential key um, to attaining a better understanding of yourself and basically a sense of fulfillment. So, yeah, I think I've completed my part. Um, with that, I end my session. I hope you guys learned like a thing or two from this um, sharing and from the previous two sharings before me. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you for the question. Uh, a really thought-provoking question. By the way, honestly, um, honestly, I feel like uh, it depends on because uh, if living in uh, urban area and having higher incomes, uh, which is usually the case of living in, uh, in urban areas, uh, like it usually translates to higher cost of living by virtue of being like in the urban area. So at this point, you have to think about things like um, convenience and like the things, uh, things like. Um, uh, like, uh, for example, like, do you have access, like, if you live in an urban area, like, uh, you have more access to opportunities to expand your circle compared to when you work in the rural area, which means you are, it's very likely for you to expand your network, and it's very easy, like, it's very much easier for you to be able to expand your network if you live in an urban area, because, like, that's just where everything is concentrated. So, I think mobility is also another aspect. Uh, and it is far more superior in the urban area, meaning you can always move around, uh, which cuts the longer time to so move around from one place to another, which is usually the case in rural areas. So in my opinion, I think the point of which is still a fresh, excited graduate who wants to experience the world and who just wants to go out there and do stuff that he likes, it's better for you to go uh, work in the urban area compared to rural areas, because you're not going to learn anything in the rural area. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind losing your money, then yeah, you should go for a high risk investment. Like I myself, uh, I don't have, I, I don't have, I have very little financial responsibility since um, during the MCO, I live in my house, right? So the food is provided um, by my family. I don't have to pay for my um, uh, fare or I don't have to pay for my rent. The only thing that I have to pay as of right now is my telephone bill. So as you can see, I have less financial responsibility. So if I were to invest in high risk investment, and then if I were to lose my money, that it, it, it wouldn't matter that much because I, I don't I don't really need my money as of right now. Okay. And and then also when you uh, invest in high risk investment, you should always invest your your um how do I say this? Uh do it little hand. And you should always invest a great little behind so that if you would lose your money, then you would have your emergency funds to use uh, for your emergency. Uh, so how important is the diversification? Uh, I think you should um, invest more in, as of right now, since you have less financial responsibility, then I think you should go for uh, high, risk, you know, high risk investment so that if you lose your money, you wouldn't matter that much. But you see, if you have financial responsibility, let's say you have to pay for your rent, you have to pay for your loans, then I think medium, medium or low in, low risk investment is the best for you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, Sarvesh. Uh, I like, I use Wahid because it's, I know that it's ethical already. And stash away, uh, I'm not sure whether the company stocks that I'm investing in is uh, ethical or not. So uh, that's why I use Wahid, you know, because when you when you invest uh, in companies or through their stocks, you basically support that company. So like, if the company doesn't do the things that you like, why would you invest in them also, right? So uh, that's why I just use Wahid. Yeah, that's all. Uh, that's my answer. 